Greetings, everyone. My name is Brady Witten, and I welcome you to online worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. As we begin worship this morning, I want to invite you to think about different ways that you can share this time of worship with others. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you can start a watch party. If you're on our church online platform or on YouTube, uh, you can share a link with somebody or even just text somebody and, and tell them to, to come on and, and uh, jo- join you for worship. It's one way that you can share uh, the love the grace and the presence of God with people this morning. So I invite you to do that. So Barbara Brown Taylor says that church is not a stopping place, but a starting place for discerning God's presence in the world. Church helps us gain a feel for how God shows up, uh, not just in Bibles and in communion, but in people and in experiences of everyday life. And so as we enter into this time of worship, I just pray that all of us will see this not as a stopping place, but as a starting place. May we gain a feel for how God shows up uh, at this time so that we can better discern how God shows up at all times. Will you pray with me? Holy God, you are light, and in you there is no darkness at all. During this time of worship, we ask that you would help us to shift our focus from what is false to what is true, from the ways of the world to the way of your kingdom. Lord, help us to get a feel of how you show up in this time of worship uh, so that we may know your presence at all times. Pour your spirit upon us, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I invite you to join us in our opening hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Acknowledging our shared life, the flowers are given to the glory of God and in honor of Larisse Say's birthday. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, your humble children, invoke your blessing on us. We adore you whose name is love, whose nature is compassion, 
whose presence is joy, whose word is truth, whose spirit is goodness, whose holiness is beauty, whose will is peace, whose service is perfect freedom, and in knowledge of whom stands our eternal life. Amen. And now join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. for tuning in today. I just love fall. Everything about it, from the celebrations, the candy, the costumes, the changing colors of the leaves, but most of all, I love pumpkins. And if your family's anything like mine, we love to carve pumpkins. It's a super fun tradition. But did you know that loving God is a lot like being a pumpkin? Let's look at that. So first, you either have to go to a store or maybe you go to a pumpkin patch and you pick out a special pumpkin just for you. Well, friends, this is much like how God picks each and every one of us to be his specially loved children. It even says so in the Bible. In the book of John, it says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Well, then you get your pumpkin home and it's time to open it up. So you carve a hole in the top. And this is much like how we can ask God to open our minds to his wisdom, to his words, and to help us grow closer to him. Then it's time to do the hard work. You've got to clean out the insides. 
of some of the yucky, gooey stuff. And that's the same way that we can ask God to come into our lives and clean out those places with the yuckies and the fussies, the mean thoughts, and instead to fill us with his love. Okay, the next step is to carve some eyes. And with our eyes, we can ask God to keep them open to see the amazing and beautiful things that he has created and placed in the world around us. Okay, it needs a nose. With our noses, we can ask God to awaken our senses to all the fantastic things he's put around us, like warm baked chocolate chip cookies or that first fire in the fall. Okay, it's time to carve a mouth. And friends, the mouth is is such an important part because with our mouths, we can speak kind and encouraging words to other people. And we use our mouths to tell other people the good and amazing news about God's love and hope. Okay, now that you've got your face carved, what's the last step? We put a light inside. Ta-da! Friends, this is the most important part because God places a light in each and every one of us and it's our job to go out and shine God's light in the world. And it's not a secret that we get to keep. It's something we've got to share with everyone. And you know what? By going out into the world and shining God's light, you might just nudge someone else to get to know God better. And isn't that amazing? Let's pray and ask God to help us with that. God, we thank you so much for this amazing illustration of the pumpkin. May we have open minds so that we can grow in your wisdom. May we have eyes and noses to see the beauty of the world around us that you have created. And may we use our mouths to speak kind words and to tell people about your love. Help us each and every day to go out and spread the good news of your love and be light in the world. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Bye, friends. Have a great fall, and don't forget to love Cubed. Love God, love self, and love others. So at this time, I want to invite you to one of my favorite parts of worship, and that's known as passing the peace. And so we do this a little differently as we, when we do this online. Uh, but uh, first of all, I want to invite you to pass and share the peace of Christ with people who are in your household with you, if there are folks there. And if not, or in addition to, uh, you can send text messages, you can uh, share the peace of Christ through comments on social media, however you want to do that. But let's share the love and the peace of Christ with one another. So uh, even though we're uh, separated by technology or however you want to say this, I still want to invite you to interact with us. And uh, there are several ways you can do that. Uh, First of all, you'll see links to uh, something known as a connection card. And that's just an opportunity to let us know that you're worshiping with us. And I really want to encourage you to do that. If you're worshiping with us for the first time, I want to offer you a special welcome. I'm glad that you uh, found this time of worship and hope that you're blessed by it. Please let us know you're here by clicking on that connection card link and just giving us a name or an email address. We just want to be able to say thanks for being here with us. Uh, You'll also see opportunities to share prayer requests, uh, and uh, there are also opportunities to practice generosity and to support the work of First United Methodist Church. So you can give by going to our church's website. You can text a gift uh, by texting FUMC to 22525, uh, or you can mail a check and you'll see an address there on, on your screen. So we're coming up on a time in the life of the church where we're going to celebrate uh, many special Sundays and what you might call High Holy Days. And the first one is coming up next week, and that's All Saints Sunday, which is on November the 1st. And on All Saints Sunday, we remember those who are part of our church family who have gone on to glory. But we also remember what we call the great cloud of witnesses, all those that uh, we have loved and who have died. And in worship, there'll be a special opportunity for you to put a name on a memorial banner that will be featured in worship. Uh, And if you want to include a name of anyone, anyone you you have loved or a loved one who has passed away, uh, I want to invite you to send that name to Lamar Drummonds, and his email address is lamar at firstmethodist.org. And uh, we need those by Friday, October the 30th, if we're going to get them on that banner for worship. So just want to encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, Another thing we're going to begin on uh, November the 1st is we're going to start an out 
outdoor fellowship and coffee time. I know people have been missing that fellowship time here on Sunday mornings. And so if you come to on-site uh, worship, uh, right outside the America Street parking lot, between the parking lot and the building, there'll be some tents set up and there'll be coffee. And we want to invite you to come for that time of fellowship between the worship services. So with those things said, will you join me in prayer? Creator God, you are our provider, and we offer all that we have and all that we are to you. Lord, we ask that you bless these gifts, and we ask that you will empower us to be your church so that through your spirit we may be a blessing to the world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that, is, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Today's reading is from the Gospel of Matthew. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So uh, I have found myself a little out of sorts this week. Um, and uh, it's a lot of different things. I think it's partly the coming election. I've probably been paying too much attention to it. Uh, and uh, really a lot of the contempt that I've seen that people are having for one another, especially people who call themselves brothers and sisters in Christ. That's just been unsettling my spirit a little bit. Uh, it's partly the pandemic and all that has gone along with that. Uh, I have found myself recently in particular worrying about the church. And uh, we've been open for worship now, uh, on-site worship, for about two months. And uh, I've just expected to see more people coming out, and it started to worry me a little bit about uh, whether people are coming back or when people are coming back. And I've also found myself in a little bit of a personal funk. Okay, so y'all are going to think I'm crazy, but I get post-vacation or post-holiday blues. I don't know how else, how else to say it. Um, don't tell, me, tell them this, but I really love my family, and I love being together with them, and I love being with my friends. And when I have special times to do that, like holidays or vacations, when those times pass, I really find myself kind of a little, really down, you know. So last week, Tasha had a 50th birthday party for me, and we spent a couple of nights in New Orleans, and a bunch of friends came. Uh, and then on Monday, my kids went back to five days a week school. And so, you know, I'm sort of, I've been missing, having that missing my friends a little bit, missing my kids a little bit, and it really hits me hard. I, I find myself having these sort of deep sighs. I, I have to kind of catch my breath, and I feel a, a pit in my, in my stomach during these times. I, I, you know, I, like I said, y'all are going to think I'm crazy, right? But anyway, so put all of these things together, and I've just really found myself feeling pretty low for the last week or so. And so I found myself in a place where I needed some encouragement, I needed some direction, I needed some help. Enter Matthew 22, 34 through 46, a scripture that really uh, offered me direction and offered me some hope, and a scripture that I hope will do the same for you uh, if you find yourself in, in a time of need. So a religious expert, in an attempt to catch Jesus in a mistake, asks him a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment? 
And basically what he's asking him is, that, look, out of everything that Moses told us, out of everything in the law of Moses, it's really the first five books of the Bible, uh, which command is the most important? Now, I'm going to get to Jesus' answer in a minute. But before I do, I want to look at the rest of this passage. So this reading takes place after a long section of Jesus being questioned, really kind of grilled by his opponents. And they're trying to trip him up. They're trying to get him to make a mistake so that they can take action against him. So he's been questioned by the chief priests and the elders about his authority. Where do you get the authority to do all these things? He's been questioned by the Pharisees about paying taxes. This is where he says the famous, you know, give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God's. Uh, He's been questioned by the Sadducees about the resurrection. And then finally, in this reading today, he's being questioned again by the Pharisees. They send this last inquisitor who asks, teacher, which is the greatest commandment, right? So it's gone back and forth, back and forth between these factions who are just questioning and grilling Jesus. But did you catch what happens in verse 41? It's kind of at the end of this reading or the middle part of this reading. Jesus turns the table on them and he asks them a question. And what he says is this, whose son is the Messiah? Now listen, this is going to get a little technical for a minute, but stick, stick with me, okay? So Jesus asked them, whose son is the Messiah? Now, this is an easy one, or so they think. Uh, the son of David, they answer. And it's well known that when the, Messiah, when the Messiah came, that he was going to be a descendant of King David. And they're not wrong about that. Uh, but Jesus presses the question a little bit further. Quoting Psalm 110, he asks them, how is it then that David says by the Spirit, uh, the Lord said to my Lord? Okay, now stick with me a minute. Psalm 110 is a prophecy that's written by David. And it's written about the coming Messiah. Uh, It talks about a king whose scepter will rule forever. It talks about a king who will uh, judge the whole world. It talks about a king who sits at the right hand of God. And so again, Psalm 110 is David writing about the Messiah. And he starts out by saying, the Lord says to my Lord. Uh, And you're going to have to think about this a little bit. But what he's saying is the Lord God is speaking to the Lord, the Messiah, this coming king. And so what Jesus is saying here is if David is calling the Messiah Lord, then how can the Messiah be his son? You get the idea? Think, Think about this a little bit, okay? So Jesus' question to the Pharisees really has kind of two points, I think. The first point is this. He's putting the Pharisees in their place with a little Bible trivia. And I I kind of like that about Jesus. He's like, all right, you want to ask me questions? Now let me ask you a question. And they can't answer Jesus' question. And it says at the very end of this reading, from that day forward, no one dared ask him any more questions. So he's kind of silencing them, right? But the second thing he's doing here is he's hinting that the Messiah is much, much more than what the people of Jesus' day were expecting. See, they were expecting a priestly king like David, a son of David. They were expecting a Jewish religious reformer uh, and a political and military hero. They were expecting to someone to straighten out their external and their physical world. Come on, God, send someone in and let them fix all this stuff. But what they ended up getting was much, much more. So great that our minds even stretch uh, to try to conceive of it. Uh, The writer of the Gospel of John says this, The Word became flesh and lived among us. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Paul in Colossians 1 says this, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. In him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Uh, And Jesus himself says, says it most plainly, in John 10.30 when he says, the Father and I are one. And so the people of Jesus' day, these religious authorities, were expecting a son of David. But do you know what they got? They got God in the flesh. So uh, 
Let's go back to this teacher of the law who is questioning Jesus. This man is standing before Jesus, and he's, you know, again, trying to trip him up, and he asks him this question, which, which commandment is the greatest? Out of everything that Moses taught us, what's, what should we focus on? Out of all these stories, out of all these histories, out of all these rules, out of all these instructions, what's the main thing? And uh, do, you, do you get the picture of what's happening here? This teacher of the law, without even knowing it, is standing before God in the flesh, God incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. And basically, he's asking him, what's the meaning of all this? Uh, I like to sort of uh, ask the question in a slightly more modern sense. What's the meaning of life? What's it all about? Uh, If you had the opportunity to ask that question to God, would you? Uh, Do you ever wonder about those kinds of things? I do especially when I'm having a week like the one I had this week where I'm just kind of feeling all discombobulated. So listen, we're about to get an answer from God, God's self. We should be on the very edge of our seats. Are you wondering what to do with your life? God's about to tell you. (laughs) Are you wondering what to do with 2020? God's about to tell you. Are you wondering what to do with all your election anxiety? Uh, God's about to tell you. Are you wondering what to do about the church, whether people are going to come back or whether they're not going to come back? And all, all those worries and anxieties, God's about to tell you. Are you wondering what to do with your health diagnosis or your fractured relationship or uh, your post-holiday, post-vacation blues? What, what's on your list? Uh, are you worried, are you wondering what to do about the civil unrest that's going on in our country? What do we make out of all this? Well, God's about to give us an answer, and here it is. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That's it. Uh, I almost think like if Jesus could have dropped a microphone, he'd have dropped a microphone. So some friends of mine and Tasha's, uh, Matt and Beth DeVille, gave us this sign uh, back in 2017. It's been years. uh, And it basically says, love God, love people, the end. Uh, So is what I'm saying, is what Jesus saying that the whole of the Old Testament, at least everything that Moses says, Jesus says the law and the prophets, the whole of the Old Testament can be summarized with these two things, love God, love people. That's what Jesus is saying here, right? So I want to point out two things about what Jesus tells us. The first thing is this, the order of what Jesus says is very important. Uh, So Jesus starts by telling us that it is the love of God that must come first. It is the greatest and the first commandment. Uh, Now, it interests me that almost without fail, when I ask a Christian person about loving God, I'll say, well, how do we love God? They immediately say, by loving others. And that's not wrong. It's, It's not wrong. But Jesus draws a distinction here between the two. Uh, If Jesus wanted to say, love God by loving your neighbor, he would have said that. Uh, But that's not what he says. What he says is, love the Lord your God. This is the greatest and the first commandment. Uh, This means that worship is the starting place. Prayer is is the starting place. Getting to know who God is through reading the scriptures and reading other books about God or listening to the scriptures and listening to books uh, is a starting place. A starting place is being immersed in the love that God has for you. All those things have to come first. And I know there are a lot of Christian people out there who are going, but Brady, what about love of neighbor? We don't, it's going to get real selfish if that's all we do. I'm not saying that's all we do, but we need to understand this. Unless our love for others starts with the love that God has for us, uh, our love for others will always be incomplete. You with me? So Jesus makes it clear there's, a, there's an order to this. We have to love God. We have to immerse ourselves in the love of God first. The second thing I want to point out is this. Jesus makes it clear that love is about much more 
than feelings. Uh, so we are much too mushy about love in our culture. Uh, too many marriages and too many relationships are just based on these sort of warm feelings we're supposed to have for one another. But when the feelings run out, what are we left with in the relationship? This is why so many relationships come to an end. Uh, when Tasha and I got married, we didn't just say, hey, you get my feelings, but not my thoughts. Uh, you get my heart, but not my body. Or sometimes I think we say to God, well, you can have me for one hour on Sunday morning, but the rest of the week is mine, right? That's not, that's not love. This is one of those times where Frank Sinatra is right. Uh, you know that song? All of me, why not take all of me? That's, that's love, right? And when Jesus talks about loving God, he says we're to do it with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. Now, a lot of people spend a lot of time kind of parsing these things out. Well, the heart means this, and the soul means this, and the mind means that, uh, and that's okay. But what Jesus is trying to tell us is we need to love God with everything we've got. We need to give every bit of ourselves to God. Love God with your feelings, yes, but with your thoughts and with your actions. Love God with your work, with your school, with your family, with your money, uh, with all of it. And now you may say, oh, well, Brady, how do I love God with my work? That's a great question. Uh, how do I love God with my, my free time? How do I love God with my money? All of it, all of it. To love God is to make life with God everything. Uh, Barbara Brown Taylor says this, when you live in God, your day begins when you open your eyes, though you have done nothing yourself to open them. And you take your first breath, though there's no reason why this life-giving breeze should be given to you and not to some other. In the dark or in the light, with a stone slab under your back or a feather topper, your day begins when you let God hold you because you don't have the slightest idea how to hold yourself. When you let God raise you up, when you consent to rest, to show that you get the point, since that is the last thing you would do if you were running the show yourself. When you live in God, your day begins when you lose yourself long enough for God to find you, and when God finds you to lose yourself again in praise. So let me ask you a question. Does that sound appealing to you, that kind of life? A life immersed in God? A life drenched in love for God? Uh, if so, uh, if you want that kind of a life, do you, know how to, do you know how to get it? Here's how. There is someone who will teach you. There is someone who will empower you. Uh, it is the one person who has always loved God perfectly, and that is Jesus. Uh, if you want to live this life immersed in God's love, Follow Jesus. Follow him. So there I was, a uh, little out of sorts, maybe a lot out of sorts, in a place where I just, I needed some encouragement, I needed some direction, I needed some help. Uh, it wasn't the first time I found myself in that place, and it, and it won't be the last, eh, until, until one day, right? And there was Jesus, teaching me once again, meeting me in the scriptures, Brady, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And so I started again, giving my thoughts to God, giving my feelings to God, trying my best to give my actions and my decisions to God. God, is this loving you? How can I love you in this moment? And let me tell you something. It was just what the doctor ordered. Thanks for the reminder, Jesus. Amen. So, speaking of following Jesus, 
Uh, we believe that this Christian life, this life of loving God and loving neighbor as self, uh, is best lived out in the context of community. We need people to remind us and to encourage us. And I always like to say, and sometimes kick, kick us in the drawers a little bit and say, come on, right? Uh, and so if you're a Christian person and you're looking for a community to be a part of, I want to invite you to consider making First United Methodist Church that church home. Or maybe you're starting out on this journey of, of life with Christ, and you're looking for a community to help you along in that. So we have a gathering that we call Believe and Belong, and there's one that's meeting uh, uh, today, uh, and uh, probably it's never too late to get involved in one of these. If you want to email Karen Milioto, she can connect you, and then there's another one coming up uh, on October the 27th. Uh, but I really want to ask you to prayerfully consider, if you're looking for a church family and a church community to be a part of, to consider making First United Methodist a Baton Rouge, that church home. And now I want to invite you to join us in our closing hymn. Rise up, ye saints of God have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, ye saints of God, the church for you doth wait. Her strength of Christ, tread where his feet have trod, and quickened by the Spirit's power, rise up, ye saints of God. I'm so glad that you joined us for worship today, and I hope that you got a feel for how God shows up and that you can carry that with you into, into your, your everyday life. But listen, life can be hard and it's easy to lose our way. I experience it myself. There are times we need encouragement. There are times we need direction. There are times we need help. Uh, if you can remember anything, remember this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. Go now and may the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.